Hello and welcome everybody to another event of the Altering, Shifting, Communing conversation series presented by Call for Curators. I am Ilaria Conti, the curator of the series. And I'm here today with Yang Yeung. Hello, Yang, who very, very graciously accepted this invitation, despite the fact that in Hong Kong, where she is now, it is 12.30 a.m. in the morning, so it is quite late. So thanks again, Yang, for being with us. <laughs> Um, so, uh, those who follow the previous talks of the series know uh, that this project stems from the awareness that this is really a crucial time to come together as curators, but also as humans, as individuals, and to try and create um, a long-term space to rethink uh, politically, critically our practices. And what we're trying to do in this space is to develop this discourse communally by cultivating the spectrum of practices and subjectivities that make our field of work so rich, so interesting, but also by supporting practices of care and by thinking together about new forms of sustainability for it. So in terms of the format, we will have a 40 minute conversation. And in the meantime, please feel free to ask questions for Yang through the comment section. I also encourage everybody always to share resources and connect with each other through the comment section. It's wonderful, I feel, when we encounter each other through sort of those random uh, opportunities. And also feel free to connect uh, with us by email to share ideas and feedback. And as always, I'm always very keen on sharing our email address. Please do feel free to reach out. So through the comment section, I will gather questions and then field them toward the, the end of uh, the conversation. And now uh, let's jump, let's just jump right in and introduce Yang, who is an art writer and independent curator and also founder and artistic director of the Hong Kong based nonprofit uh, organization Sound Pocket, of which we will talk in a moment. Uh, Yang developed uh, an amazing spectrum of projects, including the independent project A Walk with A3. Uh, which supported the right of art to be in the streets. And she's also a member of the international research network called Institute for Public Art. And we will talk about this with her as well. Um, Yang was also an Asian Cultural Council Fellow and recently participated in the UNESCO training on the 2005 convention on the promotion and protection of diversity of cultural expressions. So um, for a full biography, as usual, I redirect you to our uh, website, which you can see here, and we have a lot of resources and links that Yang graciously put together for us. Um, but now let's jump right in the conversation. So Yang, hi again. Hi. Um, as I always do by now, uh, we always start these conversations by asking kind of each other, but mostly to you, how are you? How um, have the past months been? Where are you? Uh, sort of, this is a transitional moment, I feel, for a lot of us. So uh, I always prefer to start from the personal, as we said also in a previous conversation between the two of us. So how are you? I'm fine. <laughs> yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> it's really great to be here. And thank you for organizing this. I'm, I'm, I'm surprisingly not sleepy. I think... Um, <laughs> I owe it to the ice cream, <laughs> yes. that I, like one spoonful in a very disciplined way, like half an hour ago, <laughs> just to keep myself awake. And it's very, very hot in Hong Kong and humid. Mm. Um, it's in the middle of the night and I live like two hours away from city center. Okay. So I returned from a yoga class actually, it took me two hours. Um, so I live in this very quiet Northeastern part of Hong Kong and I hear frogs. And I also hear cicadas in the morning, not at night, but in the morning. So, but as I told you, Iraria, um, um, today is quite special. And now it's just past 12 midnight. Um, it's July 1st for us. So July 1st is public holiday for us because it is the day back in 1997 that Hong Kong was returned to Chinese sovereignty. The idea of return is, of course, from the state of Beijing's point of view, mm -hmm. uh, that Hong Kong had been slow, stolen and now returned 
but the, from the British colonizers' point of view, is more handover. So then, in any case, July 1st, however, for us who um, advocate for democracy, who hope for democracy and freedom, more importantly, July 1st is a day of protest since um, 2003. Um, that was the year when the Hong Kong government was trying to push through legislation to increase um, police presence in our lives. So security acts, and then 500,000 people marched on the street. I was one of them, and many artists did. And since then, every single year, July 1st, we would walk out um, on the streets. Um, tomorrow, that is today for us, um, this won't happen on that kind of um, mode. Uh, but I'm sure we'll find our ways to walk together still. Um, so that's how important it is for us to be here together. And really thank you for coming. Of course, I, I have to thank you. And really genuinely, I do so because I think as we, again, we discussed while we were preparing for the talk, these are very, very important conversations. Like the, the sort of entanglement of the private and the public and in especially in the work that we do and in the meaning that we assign to the work that we do I think it's very important and we were talking about the fact that of course these have been the last few years have been uh, part particularly poignant in Hong Kong's history and tomorrow as you said there will be no sort of demonstration but also this new legislation is coming into sort of act or effect and we were talking somehow about how your practice is deeply intertwined with the overall situation of Hong Kong no and we tried to address that also in our previous talks to really try and contextualize where where the people that we invite to talk with us are sort of what what is the overall and broader context and so we spoke with Natasha Becker last week about what is happening in the United States and with the Maraguara before that in Mexico and I was uh, very, very happy that you were so open in your willingness to discuss the current situation. And also you very, very graciously um, helped us by sort of sharing a series of links, which again, sorry if I do this all the time, but this is a place where we find resources. So on our page, we try to sort of accumulate these resources for people to look. And you, you put together a few links of organizations that are active for Hong Kong or in Hong Kong that it would be worth knowing about or if we know about them to kind of go through their websites to better educate ourselves about what what are the situations, you know, the complexities of, of the present moment and understanding whether there is something we can do in terms of contribution at every level somehow of society. So this is somehow where I want to, yes, um, to start also to asking uh, by asking you whether you want to briefly talk about them or in any case, again, whether you want to mention anything else or share anything really about the current moment and um, sort of how you're reflecting on it um, from your position as a, a sort of art worker cultural producer, curator, teacher, professor as well. And in your in the in your relationship with, with the work of artists as well and fellow kind of artists that are with you in Hong Kong or work in Hong Kong. Yeah. I mean there are so many things I could respond to, but um, like officially, as you mentioned, the national security law imposed uh, by Beijing onto Hong Kong uh, took effect. Um, well an hour ago, officially, yes. and it was gazetted. And so then you can read about this at the Hong Kong Free Press uh, website. Um, so there, the, well, that, that the tyranny that rules by fear has officially begun. Um, it's, I say this calmly and I bring immediately uh, a musician, Wang Hin Yan, who I wrote about in the Contemporary Art Savanga website recently. Uh, we had a long talk. Uh, I interviewed um, him on his relation to the pro-democracy movement. And among many things, he sort of said in one of his songs uh, that he wrote around the time of the movement last year, uh, he, in the lyrics, was a line from Guy Debord. 
um, the essay thesis on cultural revolution. And this is the line, I quote, art can cease to be a report on sensations and become a direct organization of high sensations. It is a matter of producing ourselves and not things that enslave us. So it's the last line. It is a matter of producing ourselves and not things that enslave us that uh, has come into his lyrics. And I think this is a very um, succinct uh, way of describing the moment that I don't even want to go to the gigantism of the rhetoric of the state that is not ours. But I do want to make this moment that we are together meaningful in many ways, many individuated ways. So um, it's a great way that you open the Zappi area in, in the broadest sense of the term. Uh, that, that's one thing I'd like to respond to. The other thing I sort of um, remember, it sort of duck out of my memory is um, uh, Henry David Thoreau's idea. Uh, I didn't know him much, uh, and I'll tell you a story, but then this is the line from him. Perception, uh, the perception of beauty is a moral test. The perception of beauty is a moral test. Um, I don't know if I totally understand what he means, but I am an advocate of beauty Beauty, not in one particular sense, but or one particular sort of unity or whole, but beauty in its uh, particularities and in the kinds of accidents uh, that bring that that might bring beauty out, and so then we don't have entire control in terms of what beauty is, and I guess that's where art comes in for me. It sounds old school, but I am old school. <laughs> I still believe in the pursuit of beauty, and I use beauty not with a capital B. Um, so it is a moral test, and I keep asking myself, like, what can the tyrant not do? What is one thing, or one plus many things, that it cannot do? Uh, so to be able to find beauty is, well, and humanity is one thing that the tyrant <clears throat> or tyranny keeps failing to do. And this is what we can do as people who work um, in the arts. And you put it very well, Yaria, you said the meaning we assign to what we do. Uh, and it's an open sort of question. It's beautifully open. And we have to keep filling that in. Um, making ourselves, producing ourselves, not that which enslaves us. So I guess this is the moment. Thank you, Yang. And I also know that you wanted to share with us. So we will go through some of the wonderful work you've done. You're a wonderful, wonderful writer. I really have no words to say what encountering your writing meant to me, but, um, and I really mean that. And I know that you wanted to share um, with us a text that you recently wrote that I guess speaks to, to us as communal spaces um, in quite a direct way. And it's, uh, you know, very, very eloquent, both in relation to COVID and all the isolation we had to go through, but also through, uh, like, relevant to all the things you were talking about now, about the political and social situation in Hong Kong. So I let you just go through it and whoever wants to read about it or read it later, of course, we have it on our page, but I also shared the little, the link to the website from which you will be reading and where it is published. Thank you. Yes, I do want to share this. Um, I don't know, because it's a rambling piece and I was thinking about it as like, uh, 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 talking to a friend kind of thing but in any case it it's published because of Peter Zipelli who is a poet um, an artist in residence at Parasite Art Space in Hong Kong um, right before the pandemic ran wild and he um, well we were in conversations and he gave this poetry video performance 
that was very inspiring. And then I showed him this piece of writing and he was so kind um, to uh, have published it in this um, online uh, platform that he curated. So I'm just going to ramble this through. Uh, please bear with me. Um, it takes about seven eight, uh, minutes. I timed myself. So this is called A Little Clairvoyance in the Pandemic, Just In Case. Just in case, I have stopped lending my lighter to fellow smokers on the street. Just in case, I rubbed my palms with sanitizer one more time after doing it five minutes ago. Just in case, I waited long enough, but not too long, to email friends across the oceans to check if they had been doing okay. Just in case, we chatted with shorter sentences and longer pauses in between. We learned to be frugal but efficient with salivated words. How many from the cruise ships have started making the just-in-case part of post-quarantine daily routine, carrying more essentials close to their skin than unusual? Drugs, a book, a whistle, a photo. Since when did I set up my just-in-case? At least as far back as divorce, when I had a haircut in the evening without anything else to do but going home afterwards, I insisted that my stylist complete the styling with molding clay, just in case I meet someone on my way home. We shared a hearty laugh, an imaginary marvel I keep for myself, knowing is an unknown larger than fate. Just in case he claimed just in case he came any closer, I told him the most dangerous things about myself in one go just in case I ran too fast away from him without leaving enough of me behind, I put words onto pages. I still ended up being too fast, more blank pages than words landed on his desk. The most trivial and the most powerful can both use the just in case, setting the alarm at an interval of 10 minutes for five times, just in case I fail or it does. Death, the absolute, just in case it comes too soon, like that Saturday, I brought my cello to play for him in the hospital, but I was too late. The just-in-case was too late. I tried. My yoga teacher sometimes says, do the best trikonasana you have ever done. He has never said just-in-case, but teaches that in yoga, there should not be any moment that allows room for regret. I think of the teaching as just-in-case that I don't get to do it again. In the gallery the other day, wine was served in a wine glass with a cap and a paper straw, just in case, but not too much, so it didn't diminish our seriousness to be in art. As if just in case someone stumbles, flips, or flaunders, musicians play their best by the window and in balconies where possible, so that someone, anyone, may find solace. Or just in case someone who misses music is too shy or have other reasons to not ask for it, you never know when asking for help is perceived as a sign of weakness. You never know. Artists insist on making art. Just in case others don't or forget to or forget how to, they insist. During the democratic movement last year, I wrote a piece on the equal importance of protesting and keep making art happen. Just in case we, we get distracted by the necessity of the movement to sway from the equal necessity of making art in itself and as part of the movement. For the movement, the just in case is practical wisdom. Just in case I might be arrested, I put three telephone numbers for legal assistance in my pocket for quick assess. For the movement, the just in case is emergency thinking. Just in case the police might break into my house while I'm sleeping, I stop going to bed naked. When I act by the just in case, I direct myself to something I let the just-in-case undermine my confidence, my overly positive thinking. It works well, a little internal chant that releases me from becoming a ball of impulse, hysteria and squeamishness that may overpower me in a moment that could use a little more clarity, majesty and courage. But thinking just-in-case is different from planning for the worst, because planning for the worst involves no magical thinking. The just-in-case is more about suddenness, surprise of different kinds, and the speed of change. It's a habitful response, but never an adequate response. It doesn't seek to be perfect. The just-in-case is also broader than planning for the worst and lighter, though no less arduous. In its openness, 
uncertainty becomes a little friendlier. In its lightness, one's life comes a little closer to others' lives, the source of ardor and grandeur. You never know. Many established just in cases regulate the rhythms of life, like just in case the economy crashes, make more, save more, own more, and keep counting until the feeling of safety arrives. Just in case and com the computer crashes, back up the hard drive. In these just in cases, we know what to do. But there are the smaller and messier just in cases that interest me because instead of distributing goods and services on a mass transporter scale by technological means, they distribute attention, care, and intimacy. I'm saying our actions sometimes tend towards something bigger and better than ourselves. Not that bigger is always better, not that not myself is always better, but then can we ever be only ourselves? Have we ever been? When I was an undergraduate, there was news about a mermaid sighting somewhere off the Hong Kong Island coastline. I remember my professor writing a piece of anthropological analysis about the just in case. Many went to check, just in case the mermaid was true, just in case one was not left out of all, is rarity. In a letter dated December 18, 1950, John Cage wrote to Pierre Boulez, quote, your sonata is still in our ears. Those who had no courage to directly listen are troubled. You have increased the danger that apathy brings them to, unquote. For this anonymous them, the just in case is not active. One needs to be already out of apathy to be minding the just in case. What if the sonata does something to you? Perhaps Cage could have said this to them. Ralph Julius told me about seeing John Cage for the first time at a distance. He chose not to go over, just in case it burns. Safe keep the not yet, let it play and linger, let it direct desires, let the distance be fuel for curiosity, not destruction. Is the just in case adequate bulwark countering apathy towards the future? Does the just in case not become a burden when it steals the present away? Just in case earth turns into liquid, just in case the moon wanes in a different light, just in case words no longer speak, just in case translators are on permanent strike, just in case we cannot hold hands one more time, just in case you forget I love you, just in case I forget I can still love, just in case today is the last. Is it better to live every day as the first or the last? Does the life abiding by the just in case become better? I'm not sure, but I have a sense of what it touches and what it leaves untouched in my life. A little help in stop taking, the grand round on what is worth living for, or what living is for, once in a while, just in case. So that's the end of the piece. I wrote it on April the 13th and my best friend said there's sadness in the piece. I totally agreed, but there had also been lightness as I was writing it and also hopefully a little bit of humor. And um, it gives me a sense of closure to the many experiences I've had in the past four or five years. And to this, I'm grateful. I guess I'm grateful to life in a way that I survived. <laughs> So it's quite personal, but it touches on art and many things that we will be talking about, like in Aria, uh, on writing, curating, and many other things. Yes, and as I mentioned at the beginning, I really, for me, it's really touching, but not only on a personal side, on a very intellectual side, how you manage to bring together the personal and the professional, if we think about curatorial as professional, I'm not sure that is true, but really to kind of make, brings them in such closeness that it's impossible almost to distinguish one and the other. So thanks for also being so open and for wanting to read and kind of share in such an intimate way this reflection. So, and yes, let's, we can talk about this idea of curatorship, which I guess is somewhat the pivotal point around which all of this revolves and as you know i wanted to ask you somehow how you we can say landed perhaps on curatorial territory because i've heard you mention more than once by now in the past talks also this idea of the occasional curator i know that you teach classics at the chinese university in hong kong but i wanted to know how you started being involved in curatorial work and also explore with you this notion of 
somehow outsider, non-professional, right? Which I think some comes back over and over again, especially in independent practice, whereas the museum or the institution is somehow kind of a quality stamp, a quality mark on the curatorial work, mm -hmm. or at least it seems. I'm talking, I, I do not agree with that, but I want to kind of put that on the table for thinking as well for our conversation. But so to kind of sort of explore with you this notion of the outsider, because on the other hand, I feel that this hyper professionalization of curating has become a big shadow that also looms large on the on the possibilities of curating itself, of what it means, of how it's done, for who it is, and so on and so forth. So just to sort of uh, taking a large path, but come, kind of coming back as how, how you started developing curatorial work and how you see yourself as a curator or developing this type of work. Mm. <clears throat> I, I guess I owe everything that I am now, whatever that is, <laughs> to artists. Um, can I share the screen? Um, of course, please. There are some slides that I have prepared, and then um, there is this first one that I'd like us to look at. Um, okay, sharing it. it. May take a minute. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is the title page, actually. Well, by the way, <laughs> just a footnote on this. Um, this is a Yutbang mooncake, and on it is written Chai Suang Chai Lok. So we read, I mean, on this mooncake from left to right on top, and then left to right, the second row. Uh, this is a slogan from the movement last year. It sort of means uh, we go everywhere together, but Suang Lok is to go up and down, Chai is together. So up and down isn't literal, just up and down, because we move in so many mysterious ways, right? So it just simply, you know, it refers to uh, moving together. So the slogan has in light water. But what I want to show is actually um, Sume's, um, Sume's it. So <clears throat> about how I landed onto curatorial territory. I mean, I don't, I, 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 I wasn't clear at all. Like I, I didn't have a clear head at all. Um, I encountered Sume's work, who is a Luxembourg-based artist, um, uh, in 2003, when I was a member of the Parasite Collective, um, presenting the Hong Kong um, uh, show at the Venice Biennale. And there were like 12, 11 or 12 of us in the Parasite Collective, and so we had to work together a lot and we argued and we, you know, um, painted and did, did all sorts of things. Um, but in between, we had time to look at exhibitions and Sume uh, presented a solo and she was actually the Golden Lion uh, winner uh, for that year. Um, but in any case, the uh, title of her solo was at the time called Air Conditioned. And it, it was very important to me to encounter a poster in the one of the back streets of Venice um, saying, you know, air condition, Zhu Mei Zhe. And I was like, what is it? Because, okay, this has to be contextualized. In Hong Kong, in this kind of weather, in the summer, uh, air conditioners are practically the noisiest things on the streets. And we, um, okay, we walk on the streets and it's super hot and you sweat so much. And then you long for this moment where you can jump into this space that is air conditioned. Um, so I was in Paris like last summer when the heat wave uh, was there very much. I couldn't sleep, it was like 40 degrees Celsius. And I realized there was no culture of air conditioning uh, in Paris and maybe in many parts of Europe. Um, so then this sort of cultural context had to be told. Um, so I was kind of maybe shocked by this disparity between how I experienced air conditioning and how Sume is talking about life as conditioned by air. And I was like struck by this, um, 
and embarrassed in a way, I guess, by my own forgetfulness of how it is not the machine we are talking about. It's not mediated air that we're talking about. It is life that we are talking about. And so this is one thing that struck me. So I went to her solo and I saw her uh, really um, famous and influential work called uh, the video installation, The Echo, uh, L'Echo. I, I don't speak French, but that's how it's put. And let me just read you a few lines from a presentation I did just um, last year, a little bit before the movement, because Sumei was invited to Taipei, Taiwan, um, the Taipei Fine Arts Museum to do a solo. And this solo is entitled Nested. Um, and I was in the panel discussion and I did this presentation. I sort of reviewed the her work, past works. And this is what I said about air conditioned in Venice Biennale 2003. Uh, and here we go. Air conditioned, Sume's air solo in the 2003 Venice Biennale was my first encounter with her work. I see a woman in red sitting with her back to us. She is a tiny dot in the midst of lush green of the mountains. She is playing the cello. It is not a performance, but an image, an image that at once manifests a multitude the continuity of space, a trajectory of beauty that moves in the air, and the boundlessness of a shelter that holds up all that would tremble for her and for that which comes into the encounter. The installation dissipates all nameable coordinates around it, the screen, the walls, the mansion, the place. The longer I stay, the more it feels that the chalice has always been there, or she is the coming and going of the echoes, in the vibrations arising out of her elongated gestures, the hollow of the valley is expanded, becomes real. So in, in that room, I was thinking to myself watching her video that it would be an awful lot of waste if I would be the only one from Hong Kong to be seeing that video. And that sort of got me into um, composing or or mentalizing some sort of an exhibition that um, addresses her concerns or the, the concerns that her work brings out. And there, from there, I made my first curation, which is called In Mid-Air Sound Works Hong Kong 2017, uh, 2007. So I didn't know it was curating I didn't have that word, I didn't use that word. And it was around that same year that um, talk about public and private area. And there was an incident in Hong Kong back in those years. Um, there is a company called Goose of Desire, G-O-D, a uh, Hong Kong comp design sort of furniture company. And they were selling t-shirts with a print that says 14K which is the name of a triad society in Hong Kong. And uh, the police went to arrest, uh, I think maybe 18 designers, definitely more than 10, but not up to 20, including the owner of the brand and say that they were you know, spreading the message of triad societies by printing 14K on t-shirts. And so uh, I made a show inviting more than 30 artists to respond to the situation. It's about creative expression and the limits of creative expression. And that was the time, that was the show that I first used the name curator for myself. And I still remember very well one night, late night, um, before the opening of the exhibition, maybe a few days before, I don't remember, I called uh, an artist that I trust a lot who's established in Hong Kong, I said, should I call myself a curator or not? And then the artist said, well, what you are doing is curating. So you can call yourself a curator. So I did. Um, so that's a long way of responding to your question, I guess. And I don't have any pictures of um, Sume's uh, show in the Venice Biennale, but this is from her Taipei Fine Art Museum um, show last year, Nested. 
and I see a lot of um, you know recurrent um, sensitivities uh, the artist uh, presents and also her very close connection with nature mm -hmm. um, which has been very important for me when I uh, connect with artists and their works as well. Thank you, Yang. So, um, continuing to like, kind of continuing on this path along your curatorial practice, I know that, um, let's say, sound, let's call it sound for now, is mm -hmm. a very important notion in your practice. And if you want, we can talk for a moment about your projects through this lens and through also how Sound Pocket, here we go. Uh, the nonprofit you created came about in 2008. And of course, Sound Pocket has a whole spectrum of projects. It has an online library, which I find very interesting because alongside the programs, somehow cultivates the idea of intangible and living heritage of sound. And um, so we can talk about this notion of sound. I would like also to ask you, I'm sort of packing up different questions so that then you have freedom to go and move around. Mm -hmm. But so alongside this notion of sound and the project, the Sound Pocket project and its library and sort of this idea of moving archive, I also wanted to ask you about, of course, the challenges of developing and sustaining independent projects and spaces in Hong Kong. And then the other element that I want to, again, pack into this question is the fact that sound for you, but also it's sort of a broader discourse is also connected to notions of freedom. And mm -hmm. so I also want to sort of take the opportunity to flag this beautiful piece you published titled How the Freedom Sound, which is presented on the website of Contemporary Art Stavanger, where you were a resident in 2009. And again, like here, I just show our page where you can find all the links that I'm referring to. So in this piece, you discuss these notions, right? Also sound and freedom, also in relation to the pro-democracy movement. So it feels somehow that this idea of sound, of independence, of art spaces, and also of freedom, political freedom, mm -hmm. are all entangled somehow in your practice. So can you guide us through this process and how? You you are guiding me through. <laughs> I don't know. It's very entangled. Um, but one thing that I guess maybe to address that piece of writing first, the contemporary art Slavanga uh, piece. I was there uh, in residence last year, uh, end of from end of uh, May to sometime between June uh, for two weeks. Um, but in any case. Um, I was very inspired by the conversations I had there. And um, the one thing in this piece that I recently published has to do with, um, you know, the act of shouting slogans and the act of, say, making music and sounding things out from protest sites, for instance, which some artists and musicians do. Um, and a lot of art, well, musicians that I interview, well, I, sh I shouldn't say a lot, the, 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 the few that I have uh, are, are keeping a critical distance from uh, this, this kind of idea of mass protest, the idea of mass being sort of anonymous and you come into a big body of a united one, um, which of course, um, has this meaning and value um, on one level, but on the other hand, we must not forget the individual. And this is the battle that is current as well, like um, based on what ground does society uh, claim it has the right to um, take away uh, who we want to be. Um, so artists are particularly good at that. They may not say it in these terms, but they're particularly good at digging into their own peculiar kind of sensitivity, uh, which they or others may not even have 
you know, words or names for. So the slogan shouting, for instance, I wrote in a piece that slogans are interesting sonic objects because, you know, it's like, I, you know, there's not, there's no snow in Hong Kong, but I could, I have been in snow and I could imagine how you pack snow into a ball and then throw it. And it, it, slogans as sonic objects are a little bit like that. And they, you have to make them like that way because then it becomes efficient and, and uh, you throw far, um, throw them, you know, far into the field. Um, but art making is not about that. It's not about throwing balls of will powers. Um, against enemies um, it's about buttressing things it's about getting messy it's about being sensitive and vulnerable and also seeking the truth and telling the truth as you know much as you can see it and so um, there are many layers uh, that are available for listening I, I guess my point is this that um, if we want to understand the relation of artists who are active listeners um, to the movement, then we have to listen um, way beyond what's happening in the mass protests and on the streets. So that that's one thing. Um, I'm taking a long route, I'm sorry, Aria. It's fine, absolutely, please. <laughs> That's one thing. The, the next thing I'd like to do is maybe to share the screen with you again, <clears throat> because um, there are these, you asked about Sound Pocket, and yeah. I think I was responding to the contemporary art situation that there are artists who are interested in uh, making sound uh, a determining element in their work, like installations, for instance, or uh, video. Uh, it seems it's not sharing. Can you see the screen? There we go. Yes. Sorry. It takes okay. a moment usually. There we go. That's fine. So, <clears throat> so, so I was wondering, like, why do people not talk about sound if it's such an important element? So mm -hmm. it seems we don't have the language to talk about it. But the second level is more societal. So it's like our ways of life are um, so dense and so populated by other sensations that we seem to forget how uh, to listen, like or what is the beauty or the meaning of listening. And it is therefore really more listening as an activity than sound or making sound or sound as an object external to us, which I actually don't buy into this idea that sound is something that is outside. Um, that interests me. So it is really listening that I'd like to promote or encourage with Sound Pocket. So uh, the, the slides, um, I'll just run through them to show you um, the activities or programs we have been doing around Sound Art Festival. We have done for uh, five editions and in the beginning it was only Hong Kong and then gradually we collaborated with um, the Tango Kyoto community, uh, which is a, a small city um, next to the Japan Sea, Tango, and it takes three hours by train to go from Kyoto. And it's also the place where Akio Suzuki, our mentor and great friend, uh, lives. And his wife is um, Hiromi Miyakita, who you can see here. And they came to Hong Kong. And this is a place, uh, it's a really beautiful pier, Kuntong Ferry Pier, has to do with a lot of um, Hong Kong's history of um, the how factories, manufacturing industries are uh, moved up north into China. Uh, so Kuntong is a, was an industrial area, very heavily uh, industrial. And then from the 80s onwards, um, the landscape uh, changed. And so then people, and also because of public transport, um, the we had tunnels uh, for vehicles and so people didn't have to take ferries anymore. And so the pier became sort of underutilized. It was just one ferry service. So we uh, asked for the use of this pier to make uh, installations. Um, and we had collaborated with artists uh, all 
along from Hong Kong and from overseas. We don't think uh, of the nationalities of artists so much, but more of what they do and how their work might uh, spark off uh, interests and curiosities uh, in Hong Kong. And we work with um, artists who have different practices like dancers, choreographers, musicians, um, painters, photographers, um, the like. So I should stop there. Otherwise, um, no, absolutely. Thank you. And I wanted go to go back for a moment because the spectrum of the work is so broad um, that again, as you were talking about the relationship between sound and listening and the political, I wanted also to kind of drive back the question to this um, um, element of the challenges. Sound Pocket has been going on for 12 years now. As I said, you have a full spectrum of programs. You have this beautiful online library and I encourage everybody to really go and have a look. But I was wondering, because the work that you do is so intertwined with this political dimension, what are the challenges? What are things, because again, we all work in independent capacities, but the challenges are, some are shared and some are so radically different or specific, no, to the context in which the work is being developed or presented. So I don't want to go um, on about this for too long, but I thought, I'm sure that whoever is tuning in and listening that is who's not familiar with Hong Kong might have this question in mind, no? How you, how you produce this dimension of art and culture and curating in such challenging conditions somehow. Mm. You know, <clears throat> maybe I, I just didn't realize how challenging it could be. <laughs> and so I just jumped into it. That's one thing, um, but this is no time to be naive anymore, I guess. I, I'm, you know, in that contemporary art Savanga piece, I ended with uh, Buddhist master Thich Nhat Hanh's uh, uh, line about permanent opposition. He sort of said, it's like water, the water in front cannot move uh, without the water behind pushing it uh, to the front. And so I want to quote from his book again, <clears throat> this is a book called The Raft is Not the Shore, and he's in conversation with Daniel Berrigan. I, I want to emphasize that although these are two sort of religious um, um, leaders, uh, uh, we are talking about, I mean, my from my point of view, when we are talking about art, when we are talking about curating, we cannot leave the spiritual out, uh, whatever it is. Um, there is no one definition, but we cannot leave that out. And so I just want to quote from um, here, from this book again. Uh, it says, um, I think that this is uh, Master Thich Nhat Hanh speaking. I think that communities of resistance should be places where people can return to themselves more easily where the conditions are such that they can heal themselves and recover their wholeness. And the reason is that um, living in modern society, one feels that he cannot easily retain integrity, wholeness. One is robbed permanently of humanness, the, cap the capacity of being oneself. I mean, these are simple words, but it's so relevant every single moment if we just sit down and think about them. And uh, for Hong Kong, uh, for myself now as well, like we are, Daniel Berrigan says, we are defending human life. And, and to do that, we can't fit this sort of purpose into a regime. And so uh, I guess in hindsight, I might have just stumbled upon um, what sound pocket the piece to be now uh, because I think something was missing and that something could be better and and these are small baby steps I, I didn't have like a big heroic mission uh, in front of myself but I did see things that I thought hey can I mean we, we, we can do better than that and there is so much more to find out.
and it's about maybe curiosity, and it's also about following artists who, who are never totally happy with what they do, like so stubbornly, uh, beautifully pursuing uh, what they think is is right or beautiful, and whatever word you want to use, and every artist is different. So, I guess in Hong Kong in particular, there. We still need a more caring public for art. Um, we might have the big institutions, we have the market, and they come just suddenly, like very speedily. And they are all good. But then we also have to cultivate a kind of sensitivity um, so that art is not just about um, how much money it sells for, but, you know, it's about encountering another human being in his or her um, utmost vulnerable and beautiful state of being. Um, and I might be totally wrong. And it's also about strength, of course. Uh, I should stop here. I'm rambling. <laughs> no, you're not. And once again, it's... 1 20 a.m for you so i am actually shocked at how lucid and sharp you still are talking with us no but i think it's really important and this idea of sound i find very powerful no this kind of resemblance with the idea of flow that it kind of flows through you it works on you in different ways than visuality can function so the fact that a nonprofit organization is devoted to kind of cultivation of listening and the sonic as you were saying i think it's a very important thing to think about. And on the other hand, the other complementary aspect that you were touching upon is this idea of carving out space where there is no space or where there was no space before. And that is why I wanted just to maybe again, just one minute, but also share with those who are listening about this other project that you had developed, because again, you are an independent space creator or carver, like opening up these spaces which is a walk with A3, which we mentioned in your biography, but I feel that maybe it kind of, you know, is part of a bigger spectrum of projects and it kind of slides away. And if you can just guide us for one second through what the project was, and most importantly, I feel it's very compelling why you decided that such a space was needed in that context. And I'm gonna share my screen just to, sh to, to share the the website just for people to catch a glimpse but once again on callforcuritys.com slash talks you can find um you can find the actual um the actual website link so that people can look uh for themselves if they want so here it is we are on the session on the on the home page sorry of a walk with a3 mm. A3 is actually, um, you know, the address, the street address of this place. And this place is a, like a shop window. It's like maybe 12 feet um, uh, uh, long and then three feet uh, wide. So one person can go in at any one time uh, uh, and that's it. <laughs> um, if, you, if you've been to Hong Kong, if you've been to this part, it's just a shopping district, Causeway Bay, it's near Times mm -hmm. Square. And the Causeway, I mean, if you walk on the streets, you see eateries and boutiques and everything that calls out, uh, you know, it asks you to buy things. And we, we don't have bookshops, we don't have, uh, you know, crafts or um, anything that shows uh, people's ways of life and uh, or needs. Um, it was kind of serendipity, I guess. I encountered this space uh, one day when I was, uh, I finished my dentist appointment and I walked through the small street and I realized it's for rent. And then I realized it's, surprisingly that it's affordable it's impossible rent in hong kong is so high especially if something is on the ground floor which is why a lot of art spaces and culture spaces have to go upstairs and we call them upstairs um stores mm -hmm. and there's a room for that but so on the street level it's really hard but this one i guess is really not sort of pleasing 
to maybe a lot of people who want businesses to be running mm -hmm. that um, it becomes it is, it is affordable. And so I, I so there was serendipity on that part, but on the other hand, um, it also has to do with sound pocket, I guess, because um, things are developing. And I have a really great team um, who can independently work. And then it's time for them to curate their own programs. So I became the sort of backstage sort of person, back of house person. And I don't want to interfere. And and I gain a lot from that hands-off experience, but also lost the chance of working closely with artists. And so I needed that in my life. And so this is the this was the time when I set a walk with A3 up, was the time to um, uh, do something else outside of palm, Town Pocket. And there um, is that reason of also putting art on the streets um, because I do think uh, it is wrong that um, art has no equal right of, of presence uh, in public space for public well-being. And so, uh, I did this for two years. I used up all my money. I, I, I couldn't afford it anymore. But then I did all these wonderful projects. I mean, I, I didn't do anything, actually. Um, I just invited an artist um, to be creative about the space and develop something they had never thought of developing before. And so there are quite a few artists that I still work with now and that I have seen them become, I may have seen them flourish and mm -hmm. nothing with this project but I felt that this sort of close relation I built with them um, I'm really grateful for I, I thank them forever because it 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 really sort of is like them pulling me back to to the arts and saying you know you know here we are and you have nowhere else to go but here so so this was that important to me. And I don't think it made any impact at all in public space. Uh, but then it made a lot of impact from on me and uh, it seems on some of the artists as well. So again, I'm really grateful for that. Thank you for this. I, I cannot speak to the public impact of this particular project, but what I know is that in certain contexts, presence, is political. So being present, being there, being somewhere, I would say, is a political act. So uh, I see comments of people who are very touched and kind of interested in this type of practice. So I wonder whether it's true that it made no impact at all. Probably it made some impact, or at least it's doing so with us. And I encourage again, everybody to have a look at these links uh, on our website. And so we're, as usual, running out of time a little bit too fast. Um, so I wanna close with the question that really brought me to you in the first place when I was thinking about who to invite and why and so on for this series, um, which is something that I keep returning to over and over again throughout the talks because I think it's an interesting thread and it is something that needs exploration from multiple entry points, which is uh, the idea and practice of care. And so I'm very interested in the fact that your practice moves outward, sort of toward a common space, but also very much inward in this human and more in intimate connections. And um, the very first text that I, that I ever read written by you, I know it's an old text, or at least you say it's old, um, titled To Curate is to Take Care Of. But um, it was very, very uh, interesting for me to read because you were talking about care in a very different way. You were talking about care, of course, in, implying like in an implicit way and not so implicit perhaps, between people and artists and curators among ourselves and so on. But you were also talking about the relationship between us and the works or the work that is kind of coming out of these processes with artists and so on. And, and I just wanna bring forward a super tiny quote and then just ask you about these practices of care, like how to cultivate, cultivate them in the work, how to cultivate them in professional and individual realm, how to cultivate them again in challenging times that I guess kind of sort of stimulate but also block the possibilities of care. And in this text, again, to curate is to take care of, at some point you mentioned that uh, 
not only are the works made objects of care, but also the possibilities they refer to, the open space they hew out. So instead of the guardian of closed doors, the curator is the carer of the open path. And I think this is a beautiful way to think about what it is that we're doing here. But again, just thinking more broadly about this practices of care and it's every day, but also thinking about the larger spectrum, which is what you're talking about in this quote, right? You're talking about time, about the present, but also what we do for the future through the present. And I just wanted to just simply put this on the table to hear your thoughts on this. And then in the meantime, I encourage whoever's watching to start sharing their questions or if they have any comment or anything through the through the comment section just to to interact with you and us in general mm. i i i i'm surprised that i wrote something like that i can i share this quote <laughs> from Please. my powerpoint because this is from um my teaching and um someone introduced oh. me to richard feynman a scientist who was involved in the investigation of the explosion of the space shuttle. And then um, um, I'm sharing this slide um, from a, the essay, The Value of Science. Mm -hmm. um, like coming into curatorial territory, I have no training of art at all. Um, not, not formal training, no academic training. And I don't have training in modern sciences and philosophies of nature, but I'm teaching that in my university program now. And Richard Feynman said, you know, the meaning of all that is in the universe. Uh, if we take everything into account, not only what the ancients knew, but all of what we know today that they didn't know, then I think we must frankly admit that we do not know. But in admitting this, we have probably found the open channel. And I remember, Iraria, when we were having this meeting for the first time, we talked about maybe how, you know, I dive into something because I don't know. And so that's why I like to know. And that's the motivation for me to do something. And just maybe to end, I understand, you know, others might have comments to share. Just to share this um, uh last curation I did uh, with Samson Young, um, a dear friend and very prolific artist. And this show has got no dictating beauty that moves in, in collaboration with the orchestra in Hong Kong, Hong Kong Sinfonietta. And um, just to show you Samson and me in the exhibition. Um, I don't want to talk so much about his work, uh, but I just want to say that um, on a personal note again, um, that uh, Samson is the first person to warm my house after I moved into this place. And that um, I remember very well when he came visited, he was on a mission. Uh, he was invited by a gallery to uh, interview people who think, who he thinks uh, has utopic sort of thinking. And I was one of them. And during the conversation at one point somehow i blurted out and said samson uh, it's only recently that i um managed to see you as a whole person um it used to be that i saw him with labels like he's an ivy league uh, graduate he's a composer a musician an artist but other than that i don't have a good sense of who he is as a whole person and then we share this sort of eternal moment of um, moving each other, and then um, I mean, I I, I want to share this because <clears throat> for me, uh, it's uh, I find myself very very lucky to be in the arts and without knowing much, but knowing maybe just enough to get by and and to be able to be here like this um, and sharing all these at this critical moment for Hong Kong, for my home, and for a lot of other reasons. And I think I, I just got an email from Hiromi, which is very interesting as well, like right before this meeting. She said, well, the whole world is watching what's happening to Hong Kong and, you know, take your own pace, um, we are here. And, uh, but she said, she realizes that artists are the most sensitive 
and because of that, they might be the most hurt by these kind of situations. But then art is also here to offer uh, all that we need for the healing to take place. And this sounds cliche, but then we all need healing. We all need, uh, you know, to refresh ourselves mm -hmm. and to be able to find a way to keep going. So it's very timely email. It's very timely for this meeting. I just, I just stop there, I guess. Thank you so much, Yang. And I, I definitely, I definitely agree on the fact that this sort of imaginative possibilities that our practices bring about is what keep many of us alive properly, uh, probably. And somehow it's there that we find the possibilities. But it's again, it's a communal project. It's a project that goes beyond one person's individual practice and, and it's really about sort of the, the the networks that we that we create so we are at sort of we have run out of time unfortunately it's always very very brief i just wanted to um uh share a, a quick comment of elizabeth that was kind of quoting you again and sort of the, the powerfulness of the things that you just mentioned so I want to thank her for also paying such uh, great attention and then many, many enthusiastic comments, um, more than questions, I would say, just enthusiastic comments about both from Facebook and YouTube um, about your practice. And I again encourage everyone who wants to read uh, Yang's amazing text to sort of see the website of the projects she's been developing um, to, to visit the, the Call for Curators Talks page because uh, there we have this amazing set of links and also uh, links to understand better the current situation in Hong Kong or who's working there to somehow change the parameters of the conversation. Let's put it that way, I guess. Can you share one more link in the chat room? Of course, absolutely. Yeah. Because I suddenly remember um, there is this German documentary. It's in German. I don't understand German, but maybe some of your audience would be interested in that. Yes. German and so this was done this was done last year I was in in it but there are a number of other people so it might help people understand the movement in mm -hmm. Hong Kong last year I'm gonna briefly put it on share screen so that people mm -hmm. can see what we're talking about unfortunately I don't speak German so I can be of no help mm -hmm. but we will place it also on our home page uh, mm -hmm. so that people can um, can have a look um, there we go. Thank you so much you. again, Yang. This was amazing. And again, for whoever wants to follow up with Yang after the talk, um, I'm going to share also our email talks at callforcurators.com. We're always very happy to be, pe put people in touch or pass on questions and comments. It's very important that we function also as connectors, somehow bridges among people. Um, so thank you. It's now 1.40 a.m. in Hong Kong. So I think we should let you off the hook. And I just want to say thank you also to everyone who's still with us watching and that we will be back next Tuesday, same time. And we will announce our speaker this week. So uh, for those who want to keep on following us, just stay tuned or visit the page to subscribe to the newsletter. So thanks again, Yang. And hopefully until soon. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm.